Welcome to the football show on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesby here with you. You can tweet me at rbowlesbyjr. You can tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STL SN. Also find us on YouTube and Facebook at Greater STL One Word Sports Network or on our Ustream account at ustream.tv backslash rbowlesbyjr. We're going to get to talk Mizzou football. We're going to, of course, preview the Rams game, go around the NFL, have a little fantasy segment to end the show. But there's a big story I kind of think is getting skipped over. And ESPN is the one to put it out there. You know, the network that the NFL basically owns. And yeah, it was at the top of the page for one day, and now it's just kind of falling apart. And the little bitty things that are getting picked out of it that people think that benefit the Patriots saying that this story's wrong in this place is there's been a couple of things taken out that, had, that basically all they said was that the deflate gate penalty was for Spygate. But I think there's some important notes, and I'm going to go mostly at the Ram side of it, but I will start off about I've had an article started to get into all these situations. And it's, this is from Outside the Lines. Look it up on ESPN. talks about Spygate and all that and how far and how really deep it went not just in the Patriots front office, but also in the NFL. And this is how it starts. His burst, his bosses were furious. Roger Goodell, uneventful. So on April 1st, 2008, the NFL conven- commissioner convened an emergency session of league at a spring meeting at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach, Florida. Attendance was limited to each team's owner and the head coach. A palpable anger and frustration had rumbled inside club front offices since the opening Sunday of the 2007 season. During the first half of the New England Patriots against the New York Jets at Giants Stadium, Patriots video assistant Matt Australia had been caught on the sideline illegally, illegally videotaping. Jets coaches defensive singles beginning the scandal known as the Flakegate. Behind closed doors, Goodell addressed what he called the elephant in the room, and according to sources at the meeting, then turned the floor over to Robert Kraft. Then the 66-year-old billionaire owner stood and apologized for the damage his team had done to the lead and the public's confidence in pro football. Witnesses would later say Kraft, Kraft's remarks were heartfelt, his demeanor chastened, and for a moment he seemed to well up. Then the stage was turned to Patriots coach Bill Belichick, the cheating program's mastermind. He spoke. He said he had merely misinterpreted a league rule, explaining that he thought it was legal to use videotape to videotape the opposing team's signals as long as the material wasn't used in real time. Few in the room bought it. Belichick said he had made a mistake. My mistake. Not it was Goodell's turn. The league's Office lifer, then 49 years old, had only been the commissioner for 18 months, promoted in part because of Robert Kraft's support. And this is something that you've already seen, kind of always back in the Patriots, always back in Robert Kraft. Well, you see who got him in office. This tells you right here that was Robert Kraft. His his audience wanted to know why he had managed his first crisis in a matter at once hastily and strangely secretive. Goodell had imposed a $500,000 fine on Belichick, a $250,000 fine on the team, and the loss of a first-round draft pick. Just four days after league secu- or just four days after league security officials had caught the Patriots, and before he'd even sent a team of investigators to Foxborough, Massachusetts. So he fined the team, did all these things on his own, before there was even an investigation, like there is on any other thing that goes on in the NFL. Deflate gate, which, which the Wells report. Uh, the Ray Rice situation was a full investigation. But before the investigation even happened, he had levied defies and said and wanted to end. Basically said, after he did this, he thought it would be over. Well, the investigators he sent, they hadn't come up empty. Inside a room accessible only to Belichick and a few others, they find a library of scouting material containing videotapes of opponent signals with detailed notes matching signals to plays for many teams going back seven seasons. Among them are handwritten diagrams of defensive signals of the Pittsburgh Steelers 
including the notes used in the January 2002 AFC Championship game, which the past Patriots had won 24-17. to yet, yet almost as quickly as the tapes and notes were found, they were destroyed on Goodell's owners. Lead executives stopped the tapes into pieces and shredded the papers inside Gillette Stadium conference room. Goodell tried to assuage, assuage his bosses. He ordered the destruction of the tapes and notes. He insisted so they couldn't be exploited again. Many in the room didn't believe, and some would conclude if, as it was F, as if Goodell, Kraft, and Belichick had acted like partners, complicit in trying to sweep the scandal's details under the rug, while the rest of the league was wondering how much a lord the Patriots cheating scandal had cost their league. Goodell didn't want anybody to know that his golden franchise had won the Super Bowl by cheating. Another senior executive whose team lost to the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Now it says, if that gets out, that hurts your business. And it's all about money here. And the owners knew about what was going on and didn't say nothing. Teams had lost the previous Super Bowls to them. The Eagles. The Panthers. And even the Rams at the time. Look, these things go on. This is the team that really, that they thought that they would walk through his tape. And this is going to tell how, you, how bad the ownership's been. So it's really just Georgia Frontier died. Because now the Rosenblues at this time in 2008 are running it. <clears throat> and they're not worried about what's going on with the NFL. They're worried about getting their money to sell the team. So you got to remember this owner stuff, stuff ship goes back even farther than we even imagined with all this stadium situation and stuff like that. But now... We're going to move on to another part of this situation, which mostly involves the Rams and also Arlen Specter, who got involved in January of 2008. Specter was with the Warren Commission, the commission that was deemed to try to figure out the JFK murders. So he's a well-respected guy, and even at his old age, and even with, I think he was going chemo for leukemia at the time, he still wanted to get involved, actually said he just wanted to get involved because he had his own little theory. So he started off with a meeting with Goodell. In this meeting, he asked Goodell about the Rams and the Patriots taping the Rams pre-Super Bowl walkthrough. The commissioner acknowledged that he first got wind of the widespread rumor that previous September. Something he had not publicly said before. But Goodell told Spectre that the NFL had found no hard evidence that New England had taped the walkthrough, saying the league intervened, or the league interviewed the video staff of the Patriots and the Rams. Each said no taping went on, and if it had, the Rams video staff surely would have reported the thing as the notes show. After the interview, Spectre was even more convinced that Goodell hadn't negligated neglected to look hard enough for the truth. And so he decided to investigate the, the things the NFL had chosen to ignore. The needs, the lead's expectations just didn't add up and the senator prosecutor instincts wouldn't allow him to let it go. These were from Dana Fisher who took, who was basically Spectre's note taker. Spectre also wrote about the whole thing in his book saying a powerful friend told him that if he had laid off the Patriots, there could be a lot of money for him in Palm Beach. Spectre told the friend, who would Spectre what name, of course, I couldn't care less. So now they move on to Matt Walsh, who was the former Patriots video assistant, and was fired in 2003 for performance issues. Walsh hinted that the cheating was widespread more than anyone knew, and perhaps a heap possessed proof that the Patriots had taped the Rams' walkthrough. So how smart the NFL is when they started figuring out the Spectre was going to go at him, they went after Walsh first, and on May, 2000, or May 2008, May 13th, after signing an indemnification agreement with the NFL, basically saying that any property he owned, that had NFL video on it, that had anything to do with the NFL. He had 11 days to return that to the NFL. So they wouldn't sue him for keeping that information. As you know, the NFL wants to keep all their 
stuff in house. That's why rights reserved only if allowed loose by the NFL. So Walsh and his lawyers met with the NFL for three hours and 15 minutes at league headquarters. There was Goodell, two lawyers, a Patriots lawyer, the league's director of security that stood in for the NFL. After he m met with Goodell, Goodell told reporters that the information provided by Walsh was consistent with what the di we disciplined the Patriots for last fall, and that he was unaware of a taped Rand's walkthrough and does not know anybody who says there is a tape. Hoping to end the matter forever, Goodell added that unless some new piece of evidence emerges, the league's interest in Spygate was closed. So he thought that this would end it by kind of taking an interview saying that this happened, this happened, you have proof that this happened, and Walsh probably said I said I had proof just to lie, and yeah, Goodell's like, oh, this is in. Well, that same day, that afternoon, Walsh and his lawyer flew to Washington and met with Spectre and his staff for more than three hours in a meeting. Walsh, who along with his lawyer declined comment for the story, as most did, covered many to topics in the conversation. Among them, that the public didn't know how great the lengths that the video assistants were told to use, use to cover up the videotapes of signals. Belichick had insisted that it was done openly, but nothing to hide. When asked by Spectre, Walsh said, asked by Spectre, were you surprised that Belichick said he had impersonated the rule? Walsh said, yes. I was surprised that Belichick would think of that because the culture of sneakiness. So he was saying that because that we went so to great lengths to hide this, there was a culture, I said culture, culture of sneakiness to try to hide these things. Walsh told Spectre videotape signals went on after he left. He claimed he had seen the taping and, and when asked, did he tell Goodell this? He said no. Goodell didn't ask. Then they went to the Rams walkthrough. Walsh confessed that after the Patriots team picture, at least three team videographers lingered around the Louisiana Superdome setting up cameras for the game. Suddenly the Rams arrived and started their walkthrough. The three videographers in full Patriots apparel hung around on the field and in the stands for 30 minutes. Nobody said anything. Ross said he deserved the Rams running back, Marshall Falk, lined up as the kick returner. That time, Ross reported what he had seen to Patriots assistant coach Brian DeBole, who asked an array of questions about the Rams' formations. DuBall also declined comment for the story. He was sick. He was said to have drawn a series of diagrams on the account, an account he later denied to the league investigators. Falk had returned only one kickoff in his career before the Super Bowl. But sure enough, in the second quarter, he lined up deep. The Patriots are ready. Ben and Terry kicked it into the corner, leading Falk out of bounds after gaining only one yard. During the walkthrough, the Rams had also practiced some of their newly designed red zone plays. When they ran the same plays later in the Super Bowl's fourth quarter, the Patriots defenders were in position on nearly every down. On one new play, Kurt Warner rolled out to the right and turned the throw to the flag to Marshall Falk, where three Patriots defenders were waiting. On the sideline, Coach Mike March was stunned. He was famous for his imaginative and unpredictable plays, and now it was as if the Patriots knew where we're coming on plays that had never been ran before. The Patriots game plan had called for a defender to hit Falk on every down as a means to eliminate him. On the exact day that Spectre called for this investigation, he dealt out the voicemail on Mike Mark's cell phone. This is where it gets crazy. The Super Bowl against the Patriots derailed Mike Mark's career as much as it made Belichick's. His offense was numbered the same again and was fired by the Rams in 2006. Now with the 49ers as an offensive coordinator, Marks returned the call from the 49ers practice field. During the five-minute conversation, Marks recalls that Goodell sounded panicked about Spectre's call for a wider investigation. Marks also recalls Goodell asked him to write a statement saying that he was satisfied with the NFL Spygate investigation as previous owners had done before and also 
Andy Reid did as the Eagles coach. He told me the league doesn't need this. We're asking you to, this is Mark's talk, we need you to come out with a couple lines exonerating us and saying we did our due diligence saying, says Mark's now 34, out of coaching, this was at a July interview, a congressional inquiry that would put the league officials under oath had to be avoided, Mike's recalls Goodell telling him. If it ever got to an investigation, it would be terrible for the league, Goodell said. Mark says he still had more questions, but he agreed that a congressional investigation could kill the league. So in the end, Mike Marks got in line. He wrote the statement that evening and released it the next day. Regarding reading in part that he was very confident there was no impropriety and that it was time to put this behind us. Shown a copy of his statement this past July, Mark, Mike March was stunned to read several s sentences about Walsh that he says he certainly did not write. It shocked me, he says. He appeared embellished quite a bit. Some lines I know I didn't write. Who changed it? I don't know. This is how deep that the NFL went to hide these things. So... You don't know how deep anything is. You don't know how deep this stadium situation is. You don't know how deep the L.A. situation is. I mean, this cost three teams maybe a chance to have a Super Bowl ring. The Panthers, the Eagles, and the Rams. But it also, for other teams like the Steelers. They were in there. The two, 2002 championship game was one of the ones where they found the big notes about. So the NFL went to block this. You had an owner in St. Louis, an owner in Philadelphia, and an owner in Carolina that basically said, to put it behind us, I guess there's no way to fix it. It's what it seems like to me. And why would the Rams go at the time when they're trying to sell their team? They're not worried about this. They're yeah, get in line, do whatever Goodell says so we can get our money and get on out of here. And a lot of people try to compare this to maybe that if the Rams had won that Super Bowl, that there would be a, no problem here. But even after that, after that Super Bowl, if Marks doesn't go into scared mode and basically is paranoid about everything, does this offense stay the same? But you got to remember, once we lost Kurt, Kurt Warner, that offense was never the same anyways. There was years that Mark Bolger played some really good football. But after a long time, Mark Bolger was, an, was nothing. They couldn't get it done. And we knew that, but Mike Marks rode with him for so long. And then we basically had spent our draft picks on everything else and that there was no way that we could get a quarterback in here. I mean, there was years of Trent Green at like 40 years old coming back to the Rams and he had to play some games. And then basically since then it was Sam Bradford. So it just shows you that the NFL will do anything it wants to help the NFL. And this is where you kind of kind of be worried about the stadium station, the city, the stadium situation in St. Louis but now reports keep coming out like that. You had on Thursday Night Football the problems with the headsets, which now has been reported by multiple teams, including Mike Marks when he was with the Lions, which is just kind of funny. But it just runs deep. It shows you that the NFL's not worried about what happens if it hurts the NFL. They're worried about what happens if it hurts the NFL, how are they going to stop it to make the NFL look better? Now, a lot of people should not compare this to the Rams Stadium situation because this was going to happen anyways. Because you're going to have owners like the Rosenblues that were starting to lose money even with the bad team because they were still supported. They were still getting TV re revenue. No gains are blacked out. So they still made all their money. So... They, But they were losing money because of all the taxes and that stuff that the NFL puts on you once you transfer all that over. Where we got screwed was Stan Kroenke going over shot, kind of take the team. And the, the, the city didn't care about the stadium before, but they, 
you probably had the same situation where the these owners ain't worried about the dome, so why would the city worry about it? As I've explained before, that the city only started worrying about this when they figured out the L.A. thing. And they can keep saying they didn't, but an arbitrator proves it. But let's move on to some more, a little bit of stadium talk. As Dan, Dan Deardorff, Joe Buck, and Ozzie Smith appeared at a annual police luncheon at the America Center, and Duck and Buck, Duck, Buck and Deardorff kind of went in there and uh, talked about the stadium a little bit. Ozzie smartly kept quiet. He don't want to get his name dragged along the wall. But Joe Buck opened the gathering by calling the location Stan Kroenke's Garbage. Members of the crowd asked the panel questions, and one asked, what would it take for a city to keep its football team? I, Joe Buck said, I think it's also the team's responsibility, and this team has been terrible. It's been the same, it's been a, always a new year, same result. I think asking a lot of an average fan to get excited about going to a game when they can sit at home and get in a high definition. Your team has to be competitive and dynamic. They don't even have anyone they can put on a billboard right now. And that's true. You had Sam Bradford and Jake Long until days before the first preseason game were coming here. And they put, they're put they putting up defensive players. You don't see that too much in the NFL where they put up a bunch of def defensive players on the wall. Now they did throw Nick Foles up there. Tavon's probably on there by now because everybody's in love with him. But, he, I mean, you've had a terrible team and you've had these draft picks and you have nothing to show for it. You have no talent on this roster that's deemed high-quality talent. Even though a lot of people think that somehow the Rams are going to get 11 wins this year. I mean, I guess if Chris Diven, Divens gets 25 touchdowns because there's nobody else to run deep to go get the ball to moving down the field. You're having trouble keeping your running backs healthy. And that's supposed to be the backbone of your team. So Deardorff went on to second Buck sentiment saying that in part he likes Kroenke but believes he has dropped the ball on this one. I wish the Rams would have tried harder to be part of the community and extend a more effort over the years that they've been here. Especially when they have an owner who won't even talk to a city who gives them so much. Deardorff then asked the crowd if they knew the last time Kroenke spoke and he reminded them that it was in 2012 when he hired Fisher. With all that's going on in this community, how is it po how is that possible? Deardorff asked. Crocky has turned Bid Bill Bidwell into a chatterbox. Bill Bidwell is, the, of course, the guy who took the St. Louis Cardinals to Arizona when he wanted a new stadium. He noted that the city is now investing in a variety of ways to deal with problems across the board. And when you see a man like Crocky, whose net worth is something like $15 billion, he's about a little off there, it's more like 8 to $10 billion. that's a hard sell, he said. Wouldn't you love for Stan to say something? I like him, but I think he dropped the ball on this one. We deserve to be treated better than we've been treated. And the Buck went on to say, marketing can help offset a less than seller seasons, and cited the Blues as an example. Even though fans are frustrated by the team's inability to bring home the Stanley Cup, Buck said the community knows its owner Tom Stillman wants the team to be great. Doing things like bringing Brett, Brett Hall back, that's investing in the community, Buck says. I'm sorry, but nobody in L.A. is going to line up on the 405 freeway to watch this brand of football. Buck explained that he, like his father, believes in the type of investment that new stadium could bring to a city and not just in the, the novelty of having a professional football team here. If the Rams leave, Buck said, it would be crippling to St. Louis. There is not enough happening here, and to become a non-NFL city is frightening. Now he's He's been about the stadium the whole time. He's in videos for HOK, the person building the stadium, and the, the, the project the whole time. Now, people can go at him and say he's not St. Louis because he doesn't back up the Cardinals all the time in the playoffs. I mean, he's just doing his job there. But here, he has a job in the NFL. He has an obligation to kind of be fair to all teams. And it kind of looks he's not like he's not being fair to all teams. 
And you doubt that the Rams are going to get a national game with Joe Buck on it. I just, you can't see it unless they somehow get good. That Chris and Givens runs up and down the field the whole time and catches 45 touches. Because there's nobody else there to drive the ball down the field. I just don't see it. But Deardor's already been in the fight, as I mentioned a hundred times before. He's prominent. Joe Buck's in the fight. He's prominent. Dan Peacock is a prominent guy in the NFL. I mean, this could sway a lot of owners in our way in that situation. But the problem is, is how is Stan Kroenke going to react? Is he going to play out his lease that's only nine more years where he could go lease to lease to lease the whole time and just stay in the Dome and try to move him to L.A. or uh, to L.A., to San Antonio or to London? I mean, he's got some interest in London with having a soccer team out there. So they could talk all this saying that the city's trying to invest in it now. But it's still 50-50. And I'm telling you, the only way that this stadium gets built is somehow bring somebody with some money else, some big money get involved in help building it. Like I keep claiming about the Cardinals. And move the soccer games and Bush Stadium over there. Get some of the concerts. Split the concerts up. Give the revenue back to the Cardinals. And make it a St. Louis thing instead of trying to make it an NFL thing. Which I, I kind of understand trying to keep the team here makes it a St. Louis thing. But you got to make it an, or make, you got to make it a big St. Louis thing and involve everybody in the community. Try to get this going. Try to actually make a change downtown. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to talk Mizzou football next and then go around the NFL right here on the football show on the sports, or on the Crater SDL Sports Network. Show on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesby here with you. Tweet me at R. Bowlesby JR. Tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STL SN. And this this Mizzou team's a little scary this year. And it's been a lot different year. I mean, the SEC ain't the SEC, ain't the big bad SEC no more. Tennessee losing. Auburn almost got beat by Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State's coach messed up that game, or Auburn, where do you lost to Jacksonville State? And they paid them like some like five hundred thousand and gave them nine hundred free tickets before the game, and almost had to almost lost for what they paid for. Well, Mizzou almost did the same thing, playing Arkansas State on yesterday afternoon, and. You, Mizzou just doesn't have the talent at wide receiver that they've had. And I understand when you got these real fast guys like Denario and Macklin. The people are even sleeping on a guy like Marcus Murphy who made big things on his, make big plays on his team. A guy like a guy like Damian Washington, who I think just got released. I think he was on the Jets. But you had guys here. That created big plays. And if you look down the list from Mizzou, you just don't have it anymore. Their top, top right receiver in the game had 46 yards. 46. And I really think that's going to affect Mizzou with hands barreled down. And after that, you don't have any rushing attack. Now, Matty Mark showed up that he has some wheels in this game. And it's going to have to be the Matty Mark show from here on out. I don't know if Drew Locke can run it all. This was such a tight game that he was only in there for one pass and he threw an interception. So I think the Drew Locke lovers have probably have to settle down a little bit. I mean, Mock wasn't much better. 16 to 30 per six, six, less than 50 percent. I mean, that's not a quality quarterback. Only a 4.1 average. 
148 yards, three TDs, two interceptions against an Arkansas State team that you beat, I think in 2013, like 50 to 17. Mizzou did win the game 27 to 20. But you did it again mostly on defense. I mean, Kendall Brothers, 16 tackles, two interceptions. Charles Harris, six tackles, 4.5 for loss, two sacks. Michael Shearer, 10 tackles, three uh, tackles for loss. I mean, you had to do it on defense. And your best rusher was a guy who we really didn't see it before, who kind of showed a little Johnny football and then uh, Matty Mark, 10 for 75. 10 rushes for 75 yards, but after that, 24-65, 2.7. I mean, Ice Witter had a good game, 12 for 60, 4.2 yards per carry. Well, after Hansborough goes down, you basically get in a point where you have to throw 36 passes a game to win, and Matty Monk's not that quarterback. Is Drew Locke that quarterback, but can he run? And you were so worried about him as when he threw his after he threw his interception, you didn't put him back in. Even if the game was tight, the game was kind of tight last week when he was in there, and he went in there and played pretty good for his first three or four passes. And then he came in later in the game and got lucky with the long seventy-eight on a ward down Simo team. But this is the way Missouri is going to play. You're going to have big trouble in the SEC, and they're just lucky that they don't play a bunch of. East team. They don't play the Auburns and Alabamas until they get to the championship. But the big teams that you thought were going to be running ship through on the West just aren't. Like Tennessee was supposed to be all hyped up. Mississippi State. I mean LSU is a good team but they didn't look as good as many would thought. So maybe you have another down year in the SEC where they looked like the big bad dogs, top 10 in the top 25. And Mizzou has another chance to go to the championship. The problem is you got to get past these little bitty games that you're barely squeaking by. I mean, Simo had barely any offense, and neither really did this team. Mizzou put them in situations to give them touchdowns, touchdowns deep in their own territory. And that's going to lose you games. Anywhere. And you under 40%, and I mean, you had the three touchdowns and the two interceptions, but your best chance was to have him run the option. That was your best chance of winning this game for Matty Mock, for your for your Mizzou, was to have Matty Mock run. And I don't think you've said that in a long time to have the, your quarterback, your best chance of winning was to run. Maybe Brad Smith 10 years ago. That's probably the last quarterback I can think of that you would really want to not throw the ball. I mean, James Franklin's doing big things in the CFL. Blaine Gambrick was one of the best college players at his time. Now he's not the greatest NFL player, but some of them are clamoring for him to start over Colin Kaepernick. And then you got Chase, who just hasn't got the chance yet, but has proven that he might be a quality NFL quarterback. At least on Madden, <laughs> you can get Chase. You can make it to the playoffs with Chase. But with the no running game and not being able to pass the ball and not having an elite receiver, I mean, you almost have to run the wishbone offense to be effective and just hope your defense kind of does what they did. Kendall Brothers has shown that he's a top-tier player because there's not Shane Ray or all this, or somebody, you know, Shane Ray, I, I was going to say Alden Smith, I met Marcus Denman, and that's not his name either. But there was another guy here, Marcus, that taking tackles away from an elite off, off defensive player. But there's no chance in Mizzou, and this kind of offense is going to win. I mean, if Russell Hansborough's out there all season, you're going to have to find another running back to at least carry the load more than 24 carries for 65 yards. But you're not going to be able to win with Mark throwing for 36 times and only completing 16 passes. And you're only winning because you're against Arkansas State. But Mizzou's 2-0. and We'll see what they do next week. And it's going to have to get better. Or they're going to start losing.
Well, we'll go around the NFL right now, and it's there's just some weird spreads. That I I just don't get going on. Like people really think the Colts are at Buffalo, and they're the Bills are getting three. There's you know, Andrew Luck they upgraded this year. The Colts upgraded this year by adding. Andre Johnson. The Bills don't have anybody playing, or anybody at least that's fully healthy, 100% healthy on their offense. Your quarterback's Tyrod Taylor. I mean, do they just really think that X Ryan's like this great defensive genius? And then he's going to go up there and just not figure out Andre Luck? Or Andre Luck. Andrew Luck. I mean, the Colts really don't have a running game. But on most teams, that really don't matter. But you're kind of second wide receiver, a guy people aren't going to be paying attention to about. It's Andre Johnson. Because you have T.Y. Hilton on the other side. So I just don't see how they really think that the... I don't think the Bills are going to be able to keep it close unless they got some magical defense that I don't know about. And... They got this magical running game that I don't know about with LaShawn McCoy. Their backup is a guy I never heard of. And I wrote his name down. Uh, Booby Dixon. So, I mean, that's a guy, I mean, I think he was on San Francisco. But he was a backup, and it's a guy you never heard of. So, it just I just don't get where people think that the Bills are just going to be that much better with a no-name quarterback and Rex Ryan. You have the Browns and Jets going. Nah. It just doesn't sound like that fun of a game. I mean, it, the Jets have nobody. And the Browns have nobody. <laughs> Jets are actually getting three. The Panthers and Jaguars, another one that I don't see. I don't know what how great the Jaguars are all of a sudden. The guy only getting three against a pretty good team that only really lost. Kelvin Benjamin on offense. You give him Jonathan Stewart to take his chance as a lead running back as D'Angelo Williams has moved on to Pittsburgh. So just another funny score there. You got the Packers and the Bears. Chicago plus seven. That's pretty good for them. Not a lot of people worried about Jordy Nelson being out. Even though it's kind of funny that some people do say, like, wow, what's going to happen to Aaron Rodgers if Jordy Nelson is out? Who else has he got to go going to throw to? Well, he made Jordy Nelson. He also made Randall Cobb, who's still there. You got the Chiefs and the Texans. I guess this great Brian Hoyer that I don't know about, and this great backup running back that I don't know about in the Texans, keeps them with the Chief plus one. I mean, I understand that these games are on the road, and then they're, I understand that game's a division game. But I just don't see where they get some of these. The Dolphins and the Redskins. Miami at minus three and a half. I could see, see that's, these are ones I could see. You have a Redskins team. You have Kirk Cousins, who really wasn't that all that great last year. Because if you remember, Kirk, uh, Colt McCoy had to come in and play. And then they thought he was the next best thing in the world. Then now he was back in the dumper. He's now as the backup there. RG3 sent third. They're claiming it's a concussion. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know how long that situation is going to last, but I guess that the Redskins are trying to get the best deal they can out of it. Maybe some first-round picks or something. Just something that they can kind of make up for what they lost for. You have the Saints at the Cardinals, New Orleans plus three. Ravens at Baltimore, Baltimore plus four and a half. Which, with the reports on how Peyton Manning's arm's kind of dying off, and the hype the Ravens have got, you pretty you thought that'd be a lower number, but I don't, I don't think the Ravens are as good as everybody thinks. And definitely when you got some guys injured like uh, Rashad Pyramid, who I'm looking for, make sure I said his name right. But you also got your running backs injured too, if I remember right. And it, it doesn't really matter that I mean Joe Flacco is a good quarterback. When you just keep giving guys up and thinking that you can. Replace some guys with just a bunch of draft picks and no-name guys. I mean, I don't think Joe Flacco is an elite status that the Peyton Mannings, the Drew Breeses, Tom Brady's up in there. 
Aaron Rodgers, and even Andrew Luck making T.Y. Hilton. There's just not a lot of guys that can make your wide receivers better than they actually are. And I don't think Joe Flacco is one of them guys. And Payton's supposedly at that point where he can't do it. You have the Mary Oda and Winston matchup. Tennessee getting plus three on that one. Oakland and Cincy. Oakland plus three and a half. And then on Monday Night Football, Atlanta plus three against Philadelphia. Vikings and 49ers. Minnesota minus two and a half. And I would really watch that Vikings and 49ers game. I think I think that's might be the where you see maybe the demise of the 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick and the rise of a guy like Teddy Bridgewater. And maybe that's where Kaepernick comes in and shows that he's worth what they're paying him and he's worth being the starting quarterback when people really don't think that he's the top one of the top tier quarterbacks. And I really think that Teddy Bridgewater is a lot better than people think. And I think a year with Adrian Peterson behind him is really going to help that guy. So that, I mean, if I was going to watch a game this week, I would definitely pick that 49ers about at, uh, or the, excuse me, the Vikings at the 49ers game. Now, have you seen some of these crazy contracts that have been handed out in the NFL? I mean, the, the least contract, the least amount of contract, is usually a team that you would think would just throw around crazy money. And that's what the Cowboys signed in their defensive end, Tyron Crawford. And I didn't write that number down, but it was only, I think it was five years, $45 million. And that was the least of these contracts that were handed out just in this week. Eli Manning, four for 84, $21 million a year. A.J. Green, four for 60, $15 million a year. Luke Keekley, five for 62. Buffalo Bills defensive tackle, Marcel Darius, six years, 108, 60 million guaranteed. Now these down in the trenches guys like Crawford, Keekley, and Darius, do they, I mean, I understand that they make a big difference. You can see what a defensive tackle can do for a team, Aaron Donald. But he's guaranteed, I think, 0.75 more. Or might be .25 more than Sue. Keekly, the highest paid linebacker. A.J. Green's an elite receiver with a non-elite quarterback. So I actually think that A.J. Green deserves his money and makes his quarterback look better. And there's not many 15 mil a year wide receivers in the NFL. There's very little now because a lot of teams can make off as makeshift wide receivers if you have a halfway decent quarterback. I mean, your really receivers are on teams like the Buccaneers of Winston with Evans and Jackson. But guess where they're not? On the Rams. I mean, even like Washington, even with the big height that RG3 got, they went and got Deshaun Jackson from the Eagles. So there's teams that know, know what they need to make their team better. And Eli signed this big contract. He's already kind of flourished from wide receivers. And now with Beckham back there. And then you got Cruz on the other side. And if they stay healthy, he's going to be worth this $21 million. I mean, he's kind of a gunslinger, Brett Favre type of guy where he'll just kind of throw in traffic and not really care. But now you have two elite receivers where you can throw the ball downfield. So you can see where the Giants are building as they think they have an elite quarterback. But just in case, let's put some right receivers behind them. Unlike something that the Rams have done, they only put one playmaker, and then now they've drafted one, but it, he's got a torn ACL. So it just shows you what some teams actually do to try to make themselves better. But the defensive tackle signed to big contracts when a lot of people, a lot of them guys fall off after a few years. Auburn Haynesworth. And then a lot of guys who are drafted and do play well at that position ended up turning basically into to guys that hold up, you know, the block holes. So giving them guys big contracts is kind of scary. But if you can get the money, hey, as I always say, these cats get the money. Jason Pierre-Paul might be a little worse off than once thought by New York Giants. When they... <laughs> they're scared that he might even play the whole season as he's missing his right index figure, fractured thumb, 
and skin grass, and a portion of one of the other fingers on his right hand is missing. And he must have been messing with some high-tech fireworks. Because I messed my hand up with some fireworks before. And, I mean, it didn't blow off fingers. It didn't, I mean, it just burned my hand. And I just, I mean, and that's crazy. Did you make the kind of money these people play with? And you're out there messing with, I mean, I, I don't care. I mean, is it really that fun to light a match to a firework? I just don't understand it. And you're a big player that was going to sign a big contract and now you're disputing the contract they offered you, and now you're not going to get paid because until you sign your tender, they don't have to pay you. I mean, so I just don't understand what these guys that just messed up their whole situation and definitely just to have fun with some fireworks. I mean, that makes zero sense to me. All right, we'll go to our injury report. Is the only quarterback on the injury list is the one and only quarterback that's on it every week, and, of course, it's Tony Romo with his back. As Buffalo's I was talking about is I don't understand the spread. Is their running back LaShawn McCoy is probable with a hamstring. Rams running back Trey Mason, Mason questionable with a thigh. Duke Johnson, Browns running back concussion is probable. Chris Ivory with the Jets knee is probable. Dante Freeman of the Falcons hamstring is questionable. On the right receiver front, Randall Crowd, who's going to play, I promise you that almost, that the, the some of these guys are, uh, they have to put them on there to give them the reports. Just because you held them out of practice or what. But Randall Cobb, Packers, show they're probable. And this is what I was talking about with the, and this is something I'm going to speak about later with the Bears. Is also on Jeopardy, calf, question mark. Eddie Royale, hip, question mark. Marquez Wilson, hamstring, questionable. Then we're all right receivers. And this is after losing one of the guys you drafted and Kevin White from West Virginia. West Virginia. He was supposed to be one of your top wide receivers, and now you don't have him all season because he was hurt earlier. Mike Evans of the Buck, his hamstring probable. Sammy Watkins with the Bills, hamstring probable. Percy Arvin, who's always got a problem, and this is what I was speaking to, to about the Bills game earlier. You're a back-to-back -back receivers. Sammy Watkins, a person Harvin for the Bills. He has a hip problem. He's probable. So your top running back and your top, top two wide receivers are probable for the game. So they're injured. In the most likely play, but you don't know what you're going to get for him. That's why I, was, I said that spread was a little low. Devontae Parker, wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins. His foot probable. Michael Floyd of the Cardinals, hand questionable. Des Bryant of, of course, the Dallas Cowboys, hamstring probable. Roddy Wright's elbow probable for the Falcons. At the tight end position, Charles Clay of the Bills, another one of the Bills' top players, knee probable. Travis Kelsey from the Kansas City Chiefs tied in. Ankle probable. Eric Ebron in Detroit. His ankle probable. Ladarius Green for the Chargers. Question mark. Questionable for the concussion. Zach Ertz of the Eagles. Going questionable. Notable outs. Adrian Foster of the running back of the Houston Texans. Running back C.J. Spiller of the New Orleans Saints. Julius Thomas. Tied in for the Jaguars. Lorenzo Taffero. Running back for the Baltimore and wide receiver Brashad Perryman, as I mentioned before, is out. Baltimore wide receiver. So there's your little, your little injured, no news and, and outs there. Your injury news and notes to help you with your fantasy teams this weekend. And uh, maybe question if you're going to a parlay and question. Maybe question some of your picks with some of the big guys being injured. Definitely in that Bills game, but also guys like CG, CJ, yeah, CJ Spiller in New Orleans or the Jaguars with... Uh, Julius Thomas. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to recap the Rams game and then go into a little fantasy thing right here on the football show on the Greater STL Sports Network. Welcome back to the football show on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesby here with you. 
You can tweet me at rbowlsbjr, tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STL SN. Find us on YouTube or Facebook at Greater STL One Word, then Sports and Network. And then also find us on our Ustream channel at ustream.tv backslash rbowlsbjr. Now moving to this Rams game. And wouldn't it have been exciting to go in this Rams game? If, if the Rams really had their chance that some say they did as all the Smiths signed with the Raiders, but one of the last teams he was looking at was the Rams. And that would have been a whole different dynamic on defense because your starting linebacker is Akeem Ayers, who I'm, he's probably not going to get a whole lot of playing time. You're probably going to see a lot of Mark Barron out there. Maybe they throw a bigger guy like LaMarcus Joyner out there too to bliss the quarterback. But essentially that was that guy's spot is to stop the run. Jerlon Dunbar and disrupt the pass. But the Rams in this game, they get Seahawks minus four. Seahawks minus three and a half, excuse me. And I just don't see it. Except the Rams do actually play very well against Seattle. Definitely at home. And, it's, and we're at home. And you can look at situations and see that there's a chance for some people to have big games. Jared Cook and Lance Kendricks is a tight end spot. Also, Stedman Bailey. Because the Ken Chancellor's out with a contract dispute. But also, you got Earl Thomas out. So, both safeties are out in this game. They lost their top, their second cornerback. But they did gain a pretty good one at Corey Williams. And you really got to see where Sherman is on the field. To see who's kind of going to be your go-to guys in this game. Because if he's on Britt the whole time, I could see them going into a lot of comeback and slants and stuff with Quick. And then maybe you do run the bubble screens to that side. Quick is a kind of a bigger guy. And that's how you get Tavon out there to kind of make his mark on the field. But this is going to be kind of a teller of where the offense is definitely in the passing game because with most likely Mason out and as you know Gurley's out Benny Cunningham and Isaiah Peter are going to be your running backs and unless they get in some kind of rhythm which I don't know if all the playing time they got in the preseason Isaiah Pre Pete had a pretty good preseason Benny was kind of held out here and there and didn't play as much as Isaiah did, but probably will be the starting running back because they, they got some kind of fascination with him. Chase Reynolds is a third. I kind of like seeing Chase. I hope Chase Reynolds gets some carries. He's kind of a guy, fallen guy, special teams guy, but I kind of hope he goes out there running back and gets some carries. But this is going to be a teller of what you're going to see on the passing game all season. I don't think he can go out there and get 40 passes, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're going to get up there in the passing game and try to wear down of already broken secondary. Because if you can get the passing game going, you're always going to be able to get something in the running game. And if you get to a point where you can get past the top seven and you've worn down this second front, you could see a big game from a guy like Benny Cunningham, but the offense, the passing game has to open it up. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, what you got to be worried about is this is Jimmy Grant's first game. And the Rams, I don't see anybody that really has a guy that can block Jimmy Grant. As they haven't fared well in the past. John Carlson, the name of tight end, who killed them. And nobody knows who John Carlson is. But from what you watch and what you hear about Jimmy Grant, it's all about getting him on the line. And you do got a guy that can do that in Ogletree. So I kind of think you're going to have to spy Jimmy Graham a little bit with maybe Ogletree or Robert Quinn or somebody knocking him at the line and then kind of spy him with a TJ McDonald or Mark Barron. Somebody that's physical and can kind of keep him off the ball. But the problem is they also got better in the running game. Even with Marshawn Lynch being the best running back in the league, they signed a guy that the forgotten Fred Jackson. A lot of people... That don't know Fred Jackson, Buffalo Bills running back that kind of took carries from 
the top pick is C.J. Spiller, even though now he's gone. But he's been there for a few years, and last year was really the first year that Spiller got to take over that starting position. So he's not a bad running back, he's just an older running back. But now, now they're going to wear you down with the big, strong Marshawn Lynch. They got another guy that's going to come right behind him and do the same thing. So you got to think that maybe Seattle's going to go more at the running game. And definitely, if they figure out some way where they, you have to kind of pay attention a little bit more to Jimmy Graham and the tight ends, you know Wilson's going to get out there and run. He's done it against the Rams before. And this could be a game where he gets over 300 total yards, you know, 150 to 100, or 100 to 150 rushing and uh, 200 to 250 passing. I mean, this could be a big game from him if Jimmy Graham, Fred Jackson, and Marshawn Lynch can open it up. Because if he runs one of them little read options that they run and he doesn't, he, you know, he fakes a thing they, and the running game's going, they're going to go right after Lynch or Jackson and Wilson's going to go right up the field just like he's done every time he had a chance against the Rams. So the Rams, who play Seattle real tough, are really going to have big problems on in a situation where they never had to have big problems before. They they never had really had the right receivers, except for Golden Tate. There, he's no longer around. So Jimmy Graham and a guy like Fred jo- Jackson opens up new problems that you have to worry about. Def- and with a defense that's not very good in the secondary, secondary, definitely a tackling, and definitely. A, they kind of pay attention to where the ball is and letting receivers get behind them. So you could you're going to see a lot of play action if they can and a lot of running to open up that run game and then probably a lot of West Coast offense to get Graham involved and get their other guys involved to wear down this defense. So your front seven for the Rams is going to have to be tough. This is going to you're going to have to show all this hype and all this stuff that's been talked about. You're going to have to show them in this game for the Rams to have a chance. Because the last game, that's what it was all about, was the defense and some fluky special teams. If you remember the fake punt return punt return for the touchdown with Stedman Bailey, that's how you've had to win these games before. So your front seven is going to have to step up. You're actually going to have to play decent in the secondary, the secondary, and your offense, definitely your passing game, is going to have to work very well and very efficiently to have a chance at all to be even in this game, much less win this game. Now, do I see the Rams winning? No. Do they have a chance if they kind of have some kind of offense to go with their good defense? Yeah, I do. So I kind of see the spread there, but coming off of going to a Super Bowl, I don't know if it's such a big letdown like many people want to lead on, so I'd kind of watch out for the Seattle Seahawks. All right, we're going to move on to our fantasy segment as I'm going to pick a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, and a tight end or a flex player for your fantasy wants and needs. At quarterback, I'm actually, I actually did two of every position this week, and I might do that every week, but like I was talking about before in the 49ers game, my sleeper, my uh, fantasy quarterback and these are kind of be sleeper picks. I could go Aaron Rodgers just to make it hard. But I'm trying to look for some guys that maybe, if you have to play a two-quarterback lead or just some guy to, if you don't have very good quarterbacks, maybe you go with this guy. I would go with Teddy Bridgewater, Minnesota at San Francisco. San Francisco losing a lot of defensive players. You do have some receivers now with Greg Jennings in Minnesota. They do have in a. Uh, Patterson, I can't remember his first name, but Patterson, Cordell Patterson, I think his name is. He's a really good wide receiver, too. And also, he's going to have a full year of Adrian Peterson in the backfield, which is always going to open up the games offensive wise when you got the best running back, back in the league behind you. So I'd look at Teddy Bridgewater. I would also look at Eli Manning in this Dallas game. After all the scrutiny that he gets, and now he gets his big contract, Eli's going to want to go out there and prove it. And who better against to prove it than against the Dallas Cowboys. So if you had to probably one of them two starting quarterback leagues and you got your best quarterback you need to go for a second one, I would go with Eli Manning as one of your fantasy quarterbacks. 
at running back with Jameis Winston being a rookie quarterback, you needed somebody to rely on. And I would look for the running back to be Doug Martin. He looked really good in the preseason. And I wouldn't expect anything to change going into the season. Definitely on a team, even though you got Mike Evans and you got Vincent Jackson. Them are guys, like I was talking about earlier, if you open up the passing game, the running game is going to get better. And I don't think they're going to start off passing, but I think that Doug Martin is going to have to open up the passing game for the by running the ball. And I think they're going to go to him a lot and often. And they're going to him at not a very good Kansas City team. So I really think Doug Martin should, is one of your running backs. Now your sleeper, really, really big sleeper. If you want to go with somebody, maybe you need a flex player. Maybe you need somebody just to fill out your roster. I would go with Booby Dixon, as I talked about earlier in Buffalo. With LeVashon McCoy being injured. And um, Sammy Watkins and Percy Harvin. And also their tight end Charles Clay being injured. They're going to look more towards the running game and not trying to really hurt these guys by putting them out there making every play passing. And with Tyrod Taylor in there, I don't know if you're going to want to be in a passing offense. And with Michelle McCoy, they're probably going to go trade in and out. So I would go with Booby Dixon if you're looking for a guy for a sleeper, a guy that's to fill out your roster. At the right receiver position, this is where I'm going to hype you up on the air and on the – Aaron Rodgers train is I would go f- for any receiver that's not named Randall Cobb. So a Devontae Adams or a James Jones, because as you know, as I re- already said, he makes wide receivers. And James Jones is already a really good wide receiver, but Don- Devontae Adams is going to be a guy that's going to have to show up for these, this team to be continue with their offensive strength, which is Aaron Rodgers. So, and I think he's going to go to the passing game. He's going to Randall Cobbs will be covered by the best guy, so I would think you're going to see a lot of Vontae Adams and James Jones getting a lot of passes. So it's your wide receiver position or your flex position. I'd go with either one of them. Not the flex position. I actually went with two tight ends as with the injury to Kevin Benjamin. I really like Greg Olson tight end out of Carolina against Jacksonville. And now Jonathan Stewart is your main guy. You don't have the two running back train that you used to have. If he struggles during the season, you're going to have to go to the passing game, of course, of Cam Newton, or in this game, of course, against Jacksonville. And I, Greg Olson's a really good tight end, and not a lot of people know him because Cam Newton's there, and he's just throwing the ball around. Calvin Benjamin's that big touchdown guy. But I'm telling you, Greg Olson's going to be big on his offense without Kelvin Benjamin being out there. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, with Oshon Jeffrey being injured, Eddie Royale, Marquise, I can't remember his name, and not Kevin White, who was injured earlier in the season. Look for Martellus Bennett tied in on Chicago to make a big difference on that team. And just about every game this season, is it's a guy you hear about, and you know he can catch a touchdown, and he's a pretty good tight end, but with all the injuries they have, losing Brandon Marshall, trading him to the Jets, and then also losing Kevin White to an ACL injury early in the preseason, you're going to have to look to your tight end, of course. And definitely, like just like I said with Ruby Dixon and Buffalo, with the sleeper running back, Marcellus Bennett is going to get a, a lot of looks with all the injuries to the wide receivers on this team. All right, that's going to do it. I'm Robert Bowlesby, and this is the Football Show on the Greater STL Sports Network.